Hi, this is Ken Gosnell with CEO Experience, and today I am honored to welcome a personal friend and a leadership expert who understands the concept of servant leadership, which he learned both in his past military experience as a Black Hawk helicopter pilot and also as a leader of um, men and women that he uh, helped to lead his, uh, not only to be successful when he led them, but even after he left, which we'll talk a little bit about as well. Uh, and also uh, Chief Experience Officer in the Pittsburgh area, Tom Crea. Tom, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Ken. I appreciate you having me. Well, you know, you and I have talked a lot about uh, servant leadership and, of course, your military uh, background and experience, and I'm just honored to call you a friend and a, a peer and a colleague. Can you uh, tell uh, a little bit about your leadership journey and maybe a little bit about your military background? Well, sure. First, let me say the honor of friendship is mine. I've really enjoyed getting to know you. Uh, and it's only been a year for those of you who've been listening, uh, or on the, I just met 10 years ago. So your question about my leadership journey, um, you know, if I go far back enough, I, I could tell you that uh, in high school, I was, uh, was pretty good in sports at the high school level. It was not good. Didn't make it to the college level, but I was good. And that, that got me, that got me the, the recognition to say, well, maybe you should go to something called Boys State and ended up going to ROTC. And then that led me to, to the Army. And, you know, I got to tell you, um, being a team captain, that sort of thing, when I look back and I, and I whatever my roles were in leadership and I got into ROTC, I knew, I realized that I knew nothing about leadership. And I, and I, even, even as I was doing well in ROTC and I finally get in the army way back in May of 1983 and my first month uh, at the infantry officer basic course at Fort Benning, Georgia, I'm doing pretty well. I'm in the top third of my platoon and I'm, I mean, I didn't think I was egotistic, but I'm full of myself. And, you know, we have this exercise a month later, and it's a road march. And, uh, you know, if you wanted to read the whole story, it's on, I've got both of these stories that I'm getting ready to tell you on my LinkedIn uh, uh, articles. But the, at the end of this road march, um, I, I'm, I force my, I cause my tune, platoon to miss their deadline, and therefore we failed the, uh, the mission. And so at the end of that particular month of peer evaluations, I drop from the top third to the middle third. And another month goes by and a similar exercise and very hot Fort Benning. And, and I, now I'm the leader and I have another terrible experience. And now I drop from the middle third to the bottom third. And so I got to tell you, you know, I, um, I, then I went off to flight school, Fort Rucker, Alabama. And <laughs> I, I went there with a whole different attitude about leadership in a whole different spirit about humility. So I guess I wanted to highlight that one word, humility, uh, uh, as my answer to your question. Well, I think that's, uh, you know, I think every leader has some setbacks and failures, which probably makes us uh, um, understand leadership better. Um, so overcoming those difficulties, I think, are really critical. And sometimes as leaders, we are, we're afraid to share those difficulties or those failures that we've had. But it really does engender kind of that, um, spirit that we should have as a leader as we lead our teams because everybody can relate to mistakes. So I appreciate your humility and in, in saying that. You know, one of the things I appreciate about you, you, um, as you mentioned, you went on to flight school and you flew the uh, Black Hawk helicopter. And one of the things you learned a lot about leadership, I can't even imagine the power of feeling like uh, piloting uh, such a, a great piece of machinery. But one of the lessons that you learned was about overcoming blind spots. Can you talk a little bit about what the helicopter training taught you and what you learned about blind spots in that, in that, um, through that process? Yeah, I mean, I, part of it goes back to flight school and what we learned. And um, you can imagine, you know, go think back to driver's ed and you're taught by your uh, instructor to keep your head on a swivel, turn left and right. And um, that was only amplified being in a helicopter because you know, a little fender bender on the ground um, is uh, not a big deal compared to if you have a blade strike in with an aircraft. Uh, so one is catastrophic and life threatening. But uh, but that led me to as I as I got out and to to really think about blind spots and they go beyond um, 
they go beyond the physiology of driving and flying uh, into our communication styles. So when I talk about communication styles in my coaching, I, I, I talk to people about, hey, you got there four different communication styles and you need to know what the other three are because you're one of them. And, you know, you simply have to answer two questions. Are you introvert or extrovert? Are you people or are you task oriented? And you can figure out the other ones. Now, I say all that to say this is kind of the lead into, well, you, everybody has strengths and everybody has weaknesses and, and everybody has blind spots. And it's really, really important to know what your blind spots. So if we think back to driver's ed and the optic nerve and you think, well, wh why do we have that up blind spot? It's really important. And if you know why you have the blind spot, you can take the corrective an action. So let's go back to driver's ed. So at the, where the, the optic nerve attaches to the back of the eyeball, there are no rods and cones in that spot of the eye. And therefore, that causes us to have a 45 degree blind spot off of our left front and a 45 degree blind spot off of our right front. Now, I don't know, you know, this works for me because I'm doing mirroring if I were normally, but now that I'm on a screen and video, I don't know if that, when I said, when I said left front, good, okay. Because I actually was going for my right eye. Anyway, this the question about now we're in this virtual world. But um, so now that you know that there's a reason for that blind spot, Hey, well, that's why I have to turn my head left and right. The same thing applies in communication. If you don't speak, let's, and I use this, so there's a D, the I, the S, and C. If you're a D and you don't speak well to the I, S, and Cs, um, there's a reason for it. What are those blind spots? And, you know, the biggest thing that I, I like to share at the end of that particular exercise or scenario is this. You know, I always ask the question, I try to ask the question, what's the difference between a blind spot and a weakness? And the answers are never the answers that I hope for. So I don't ask anybody to share their answers anymore. I just say, I want to give you Tom Crea's um, interpretation of what those are. A blind spot is something that you're aware of and you can take the corrective action. A weakness is either something you're not aware of or something you know about and sadly you choose to ignore. I love that definition. And actually, Tom and I uh, co-authored an article for business.com where we talked a little bit about blind spots and the leader's blind spots. But Tom's definition is powerful, right? Uh, blind spots, are we're aware of it. We know just like in driving that there's a, a, a part of our vision that we can't see. There's something that, that we don't know that's there, but we know that there's a blind spot. We know that there's a gap that's there. And we can take corrective action because we know that that happens. And here's the truth. And Tom, I want to get your insight on this as well. Every leader has blind spots, right? So how do we find out where those blind spots are and what corrective action should we take in order to, to help shore up some of those blind spots? How do you, what, what is your encouragement to, to leaders? Because I think maybe even as we come through this crisis, uh, COVID, we've recognized some blind spots in our company that maybe we didn't even recognize, but how, how do we know where those blind spots are and how do we address them? So I'd like to circle back to my, my, uh, <laughs> my formative lesson in lessons, excuse me, plural, in humility. And, and I got to tell you, I, I, we don't have enough time to go through all the mistakes that I made, but I, I'm highlighting the top two. So, um, but I learned a lot about myself and all the mistakes that I made. And I, I think that's a central thing for any leader to realize is that, hey, you know, you don't have all the answers and you're going to make mistakes. So how do you how do you do those things? Let me let me segue into my first job. And I'm a platoon leader and I it's a Saturday morning. All I want to do is fly because, you know, I'm not doing well. I didn't do that well in flight school. That's one of the reasons why, you know, I didn't start my career flying the Blackhawk because I didn't do as well as I thought I was going to do and um, or I'd hoped to do. So I start my career flying the older uh, Vietnam era Huey helicopter and I get there and the very first time I fly, I, I don't fail at navigation. I don't do well and I just need practice. Be and because I'm one of a number of new young aviators, it's hard to get flight time and you've got to fly with an instructor pilot. So I'm finally scheduled it's a Saturday morning. I'm excited to fly. I go out, I come back from my pre-flight and the the instructor pilot intercepts me and he says, sir, I smell alcohol in Sergeant X's breath. And I'm looking and he can see the blank stare right across my face. He says, sir, you need to take Sergeant X in for a drug and alcohol test. Like, 
so you ask this question, you know, one of the things I guess we have to realize is that we don't have all the answers that the people on our team, if you trust them and you, you respect that they're going to give you, if you respect them and you trust that they're going to give you the right answers um, or lead you in the right direction, that then you're going to be able to make better decisions. And, you know, I, I found myself taking him to the nearest medical facility, which is about 15 miles away. Now here I am, I'm a 23 year old young lieutenant and I've got this sergeant who's older than me, who's got more years of experience and I've got 18 whole months of experience and all of them are in schools. And so I really had about a month or two of actual being in the army. And we get on the Soul Food Sun Highway and no sooner than we get out there, the, our MASH era army Jeep breaks down. Me, that sergeant, and another experienced soldier on the side of the road. So I have to radio for help come. At any rate, so I digress, but, but it, it goes back to this. I, I, I just learned there were some, that was a fork in the road decision for me. And there were some character assessments there, um, uh, character points that, you know, what, what was I really made of? And, and so to go back to your question, it's just about, I guess because I learned that spirit of humility early and it was the most valuable lessons, they were the most valuable lessons I learned. I learned to trust the people on my team. Now, of course, I had to be smart enough to decipher whether or not they were trying to give me information for personal gain um, or to avoid something. Um, but in this particular case, it was it was the right thing, but it was a hard decision. Right. Well, I think it turned out to be the right decision. But go right. Ahead. I think leaders, though, you know, when we you know, I, I, I do think it's important to understand, you know, what angle at times people are talking to us from. But, you know, as leaders, when we understand our blind spots, when we understand those areas that we can't see or that they're dangerous, if we don't address them or take evasive action, like you've said, um, can be dangerous for us. It can be dangerous for our companies. It can be dangerous for our leadership. When we're authentic about where those blind spots are and we recognize them, that's when real breakthroughs happen, I think, as a leader and even for our company. I've said for many years that um, self-awareness always precedes self-improvement. And sometimes I can be aware because I bang my head against the wall a thousand times, right? <laughs> and I say, hey, wait a second, I want to try something different. Sometimes I can be self-aware because a friend will come to me or somebody on my team and will say, hey, Ken, you know, here's a mistake that is happening over and over again, or here's a reality that you need to come to terms with, you know, you're overextended or you respond negatively at a certain time. You know, the Bible says that the, the wounds of a friend can be trusted, right? And that's what you're talking about here about these, these blind spots. And so that's why there's the value of a team, right? And humility says, hey, I'm not perfect, it's okay for me to have some blind spots, just like a helicopter pilot. I think that's one of the powerful imageries of what you talk about, right? Here you're, you're in charge of this wonderful, powerful machine. And yet, even as a pilot that has all the controls at your disposal, there's still a portion of you, uh, that, that there's an area that you can't see. Uh, and so you've got to think, you know, hey, I got to recognize here's where I can't see. Maybe I look at my radar or whatever those things are in my, my cockpit so that I can take that evasive action when it comes. Hey, I think that humility, Tom, um, has led you on a journey to become a servant leader, uh, leadership expert. And I think one of the things that connected us was your whole philosophy of servant leadership. And so, you know, we were talking before, a question that often gets asked, and I'd like for you to really unpack it is, how do you define servant leadership? And why should leaders want to be excellent at becoming a servant leader. Okay, and now to be honest, um, I feel like I experienced servant leadership in my Army career, but it wasn't until I became a coach and a speaker that I, I was doing some research. And there was a gentleman by the name of Robert K. Greenleaf, and he wrote, um, he wrote an essay. I forgot the name of the essay, but essentially he talks about the best, a three-part best test of what a servant leader is. Um, so let me see if I can get these off uh, the top of my head. First, do those served, are those served, do those served like are likely to become servant leaders? Do they, while being served, are likely themselves to, 
to treat others the same way? And the third part, what is the effect on the, the greater effect on society in the community? So number one, are you, are you treating them that way? Number two, are you training them to become that type of leader? And number three, are you, your team, and all the people you're influencing impacting society as a greater whole? So was there a two-part question or was it just that? Just why should we embrace servant leadership? Or oh, what's so, so yeah, so I, so let's get back to my army career. So I had, I was very fortunate that my very first battalion commander was a great role model. As a matter of fact, uh, I have contact with him today and we're talking back in 1984 when I met him. And he, he just was just the greatest role model. And why? Because you know, one of the values the army has, it's, it's, we have a, we have an acronym for everything and the values are this, uh, the acronym is leadership, L-D-R-S-H-I-P. And the S sandwiched in the middle is selfless service. And, and I have to tell you the people that I was around that really were the, the best influencers for me were the ones who were selfless servants. And, and I just feel like uh, when I did that, the, the people on my teams could see that as well and they responded to that. And I just believe, you know, there's a quote. There's a quote out of a, a newer book. And the name of the book is called Leading Business Beyond Profit. It's by a gentleman out of South Africa. His name is Charles Coetzer, C-O-E-T-Z-E-R. And in this book, there's a quote that's, that goes something like this. Um, as a matter of fact, I can probably read it to you because I have it and I will. Um, just because I don't want to botch it. It goes like this. Companies that did business from a foundation of love and purpose, and I highlight those on my website, and practice servant leadership highlighted as well, produced a 1,026% return to shareholders over a 10-year period, eight times more than good to great companies. Now, that's pretty impactful. And most people out there want to say, well, servant leadership is too soft and it just doesn't get things done. All right, well, you know, those aren't the people I want to work with. I want to work with the people who believe that first and foremost, taking care of the, the people on their team and treating them well is a priority. And then also recognizing that, hey, some of the greatest leaders were those types of leaders and they run the, 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 the best business in the world, as this quote would tell you. And if you're not aware, um, in the Jim Collins Good to Great book that he wrote, a number of those companies that were good to great ended up um, fall, failing later. And I don't know the exact details, but I know that's the, that's history telling us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he actually, Jim uh, Collins wrote another book called um, Too Mighty to Fail. And he talked about, it was a follow-up to book that some of the companies, because they had some different characteristics, it's not as popular, but those companies ended up uh, failing because they had certain gaps in their in their leadership but man what you said was powerful companies that are led by servant leaders can you state can you give that statistic again a yeah. thousand go ahead yeah well let me just say they did business from a foundation of love and purpose and practice servant leadership produced a 1026 percent let me say it again 1026 percent return to shareholders over a 10-year period I mean, that's, that's pretty powerful. I mean, a thousand percent return based on doing it by love and purpose. Wow. That's pretty powerful. If you think and it ties into what, why you and I are connected because what's your quote, something about, and I, and I actually posted it recently on social media about it's the people that we take care of that matters for eternity. I, how does it go? Why don't you just tell, tell yeah, us all the, what it is? The souls of the people that we have are the only thing that businesses take into eternity, right? And if we care about, the point of it is that if we care about individuals, not only are we going to have a return here as we care for our customers and employees, but we have a potential to take them into eternity with us, which is powerful if we begin to think about it from that perspective. So thank you for remembering that quote. That's good. <laughs> but, you know, I just, I love the concept of servant leadership. Um, you know, I expand that a little bit. I, I believe in servant leadership. I see myself as a servant leader. I try to challenge every CEO that I work with where we talk about servant leadership. And then we expand the definition to some degree to talk about from a stewardship perspective, because I believe that servant leadership ties into servant or steward leadership. 
where if I'm really caring about others and I'm trying to do the right things and I'm doing it according to purpose, it helps me to think about it in terms of I'm a steward that's going to give this up at some point, but that's going to carry into a, a, a legacy. You know, the idea of servant leadership, Robert Green Greenleaf's uh, uh, essay and then turned into a book is still uh, one of the most phenomenal books that's ever been written on leadership. And if you haven't read that book, uh, I encourage uh, every leader to read that book because he does outline kind of what, how to define servant leadership and why it's important. And then from a Christian perspective, uh, Tom, as you know, I mean, we, one of the examples that we model is Jesus and uh, where he uh, got down on his knees and washed his disciples' feet. And that's really the, the model of, of servant leadership. But I think it's broader even, I mean, obviously that comes from our heart perspective, but servant leadership, and you hit it in that quote, really just means that I have a nobler purpose uh, of why I'm doing the things that I'm doing and that I care about the, the people that I'm doing it for, right? And, and so that's really a, a critical aspect uh, for us as well. Um, um, somebody just posted uh, about servant leader, this definition, the servant leader is more inclined to empower rather than to flex positional power by commanding and controlling the response of the followers. So Daniel, thanks for sharing that quote. That's, that's really powerful. Uh, Tom, uh, it's an interesting paradox that you lived and you talked about um, your military service. And yet in that you saw great servant leaders. And then of course you learned more about their definition of leadership. To Danielle's point, can you talk about, I think leaders sometimes, when you even mentioned it in that quote, you say, well, servant leadership is soft. But I think you found that servant leadership is, is strong. It's really an empowering way to lead. Can you talk about that a little bit? How do, how do we serve, but yet have that way of influencing and not necessarily controlling? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about, <laughs> I'm thinking about a present challenge <laughs> with my 10 year old son. And this has applicability, um, soon to be 10 year old son. So when, when, uh, when Coetzer writes from a, from a position of love and purpose, I would tell you that when I was in the, my leadership roles and I looked at the people on my team, I didn't look at them just as somebody who reported to me. I actually looked at them, them as people who were um, partners. Mm -hmm. And yes, I was the one in charge. And yes, I was the one who had to make, make the hard decisions. And I, and I got to tell you, you know, these are lessons that I, I didn't realize them at the time, of course, but lessons that I learned from my parents. Everyone here has learned important lessons from their parents. And, you know, if you treat the people on your team the way you would your child, and I don't mean it that way directly, but you get the idea. If you treat them with the idea that, hey, I'm in charge, but if I help you learn and grow, and I treat you with the love, the empathy that everyone needs and wants and deserves, then then yeah, I'm going to be able to get you to be more responsive. Now, of course, just like a parent, if you start to do something where you're out of line, this is why I'm thinking of my, my son yesterday and the challenges uh, that I had with him yesterday, um, then you, you just, you have to make those hard decisions. And so it doesn't mean you're soft. It, it means that as a servant leader, if you truly care and you love for those, the love of those people and you want to, what's best for them, you are going to sometimes make decisions that they don't like. And I don't think there's anything soft about that. So hopefully that addresses that question. <laughs> I think that's very powerful because I think that is one of the critiques that sometimes people feel like servant leadership to soft leadership. And I actually think servant leadership is the toughest type of leadership because you're not only thinking about the objective that you're trying to achieve, but you're thinking about the people that, that are trying to achieve that objective. And you're thinking about how do I bring out the best in those individuals? How do I serve them so that they can ultimately accomplish the purpose that they've been called to, to accomplish. And I think using the military model of that, um, as you train, as you develop, as you lead, I think is really critical. You know, let's hey, talk let me about, Let me interject that because I'm thinking of something that's one of the reasons why I'm excited about working with you is because you'll, you'll, you'll nail, you'll nail this. You're better at remembering scriptures. Um, Remember that part in the passage where it's almost like Christ scolded Peter for not having the right answer? Mm -hmm. 
that's exactly what I mean. He is the epitome of a servant leader, and and I. I was just thinking of that passage as you were talking. So if you want to expand on that passage, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite, um, I mean, when we talk about servant leadership, I mean, obviously we we think of Jesus as the greatest example of a servant leader. And, you know, he had 12 uh, disciples that had all different gifts and abilities and talents. And yet we know that Peter was one of uh, his closest disciples. And And sometimes Jesus's words to Peter were very strong. And there's one story that Tom's mentioning, and you guys are all probably familiar with it, but where Peter is wanting Jesus to kind of take more of a leadership role. He's wanting him to assume the level of messiahship or kingship that he believes that Jesus deserves. And so he basically comes to Jesus one day and says, hey, Jesus, why don't you go ahead and become the king? You know, you're the, you're the king of the Jews. You're, you could go ahead and own your kingship now. And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, get, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't know what you're talking about, basically. You don't know what you're saying. And I mean, you think about the strong words of, you know, here Peter was coming to Jesus and saying, hey, I see you as this great leader. And I want you to assume this great role that, you know, Peter had in his vision. And yet the words that Jesus spoke to Peter was he, he equated Peter to Satan. And, you know, you think about the harshness of that. I mean, you know, I'm sure Jesus had preached many messages about how Satan was um, the opposite of everything that was part of the kingdom of God. And yet here he basically says to Peter, you're Satan. You know, you're, you're speaking as if Satan was here tempting me. And I mean, probably no harsher words could be said to someone. Now, did it shake Peter up? Absolutely. Did it help Peter to come into right alignment? Yes, absolutely. Was Jesus doing it to be mean and nasty? No, I don't think he was. I think he was doing it out of his heart to say, hey, Peter, don't let this wickedness get inside of you. Don't, don't have this attitude of we deserve it. It should be ours. We've got to do it in the right way, in the right style, in the right time, according to what God wants us to do. And so, you know, I just look at that and, you know, sometimes we, as, as leaders, sometimes we can say some harsh things to, <laughs> to, to our teams, and, and I'm, not, I'm not advocating, I mean, I think it needs to be intentional and not reactionary. I think we need to be very thought out, and the Ephesians tells us that the words that come out of our mouth should be that for edification and encouragement of those that hear it. But I do think that we shouldn't be afraid to, to say strong words when it's especially important to the hearers to bring them back into alignment to what the ultimate purpose and, and goal, goal is. That message must have been on my shoulder in the past 24 hours. <laughs> and it should be on all of our shoulders at times, right? Because, you know, it's challenges, it challenges us, uh, just as you mentioned before, even when, you, you know, your story you talked about, about your a sergeant, you know, uh, if I've been called to speak truth into somebody's life, right? That, that's servant leadership. It means that I have to have the, now if I have, I have to have the right attitude, but it means I have to have the right, that I, I have to have the boldness to have that conversation to say, hey, you're really letting the team down or you're not leading at the highest level or you're making this mistake, but it's not a, it's not an attitude of harshness. It's an attitude of helpfulness. Right. And I think that's the, that's the demarcation for us. Hey, Danielle uh, wrote, talked about, uh, another quote, she says, the spirit of a leader as a servant may be just what is needed to implement a strength-based paradigm. Practiced and taught by Jesus more than 2,000 years ago, potentially it can transform leadership, the workplace, and society. Boy, that's a great quote, Daniel. Thank you very much. Hey, Tom, any practical suggestions of where to start on servant leadership? How do we, how do we start to bridge that gap? What's the kind of the first steps that you would encourage any leader to to take as they wanted, if they wanted to understand more about how to become more of a servant leader, what's the first first action steps that they should take? So now I'm reflecting on, uh, you know, when I'm speaking, one of the things I ask people is, um, what's your leadership purpose? Mm. On the one hand, your reasons, people are wanting to lead because their reasons are about position, power, or money. On the other hand, the other extreme, excuse me, that your reasons are about serving others. And when I, and when I show that, I, I show the, this, this 
obviously this picture of one of those bubble-headed guys where they're they're in charge. And then when I talk about on the far right, I show two faces. And those two faces happen to be from India. They are Gandhi and Mother Teresa. And and so when I when I ask them, well, what's your leadership purpose? If it's not about serving others, then then that's a problem. But the most important thing I suggest them was wherever you are on that continuum, my goal at the end of this discussion is to, to move you to the right. So to answer your question, the first thing is I think people need to look in their heart and, and decide why they are in a leadership role or why they want to be in a leadership role. You know, I, I think there are a number of lessons that I learned. Um, when I look back, lessons that I learned, I can think of things that I learned in the Bible. I wrote one down as you were talking earlier. Like, wow, I, I, that's something I didn't realize. Get the get behind the Satan was something that applies in a different context, and and I just never thought about that way. But you know, in the army, um, that was something else. Like the, you could be there. And this happens in uh, everywhere, I'm sure. You have different structures of different people, but you have your blue-collar workers and you have your white-collar workers, and I technically was a white-collar worker. And we had these in-between people, and they were called warrant officers. And they they didn't have the, the primary responsibility of a commission officer, but they they had a they had they were specialists they were they were very good at what they did, and, and they were the experts in those areas. And sometimes people just don't want to really take care of people. And if you don't want to take care of people and you don't want to serve them, then you don't want to be a servant, then you're not going to be a servant leader. But if you, but if your, your heart is because you just want to be the best at something like an instructor pilot, then, then go be that technical expert. Um, so I don't know if I got a, up in a tangent there, but, but that's where, you know, how do you become a servant leader? I think the first thing you got to do is look in your heart and say, what's my purpose for wanting to be a leader? You got to ask that question and answer it first, honestly to yourself. You know, I think uh, I'd love that uh, place to start. I think it's really critical for us and, you know, understanding if it's about, a, like you said, the technical expertise or a particular project or whether it's really about people that we're called uh, to align ourselves with. You know, servant leaders, we're not perfect and, you know, we make mistakes just like you mentioned before, but it really speaks to the value of the most important asset of any business is the people. And I think we've seen right now through this downturn, you know, obviously high levels of unemployment, companies having to deal with people in different ways, maybe communication was lacking. And it's going to be interesting to see, we're already starting to see a lot of companies file for bankruptcies and, and those kinds of things, which is unfortunate. But, you know, if companies that care about their people and that really have this relationship, this bond with the their people, as you mentioned earlier, have a great level of success. So just even that attitude of saying, hey, I, I care about them. I care about people. I want to contribute into other people's lives, I think is really an important aspect of, of a good, healthy company culture and a good uh, leadership style. Hey, Tom, real quick, let's finish this about serving leadership. Then I have a couple of other questions about goal setting and overcoming blind spots and personality issues and those kinds of things. But um, let's talk about company culture. How have you found servant leadership impact culture? And do you think that that's really a critical success as you multiply this concept of servant leadership, not only from the top leader, but in mid-level managers and, and all the way through the organization? I mean, I know in uh, the military, obviously, it was not only important for the the top commander to have an attitude, but even all the way down to platoon leaders. So how do you impact culture through servant leadership? What's the best advice that you could give us there? So I think back to something that um, it's called the after action review. Mm -hmm. And uh, are you familiar with it? I am. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, so the after action review was introduced to the military in the early eighties. And I was the beneficiary of having that throughout my career, but it wasn't introduced to corporate America until the late 90s. Um, and why? Because corporate America realized that the Army was learning such value, or they were, the Army was learning such valuable lessons and they wanted to take part in as well. So let me kind of describe that to you and why it's the answer to your question is how, how do you do that? And I talk about it as creating a culture. So 
the big difference between an after action review and an after action report for those who aren't aware an after action report is everybody writes down their great ideas and you know they get they get sent somewhere and somebody puts the three ring holes in them and puts them in a binder and they get stuck on a shelf somewhere um, that's the metaphor but an after action review and we would call this a hot wash in army aviation because if you're standing behind the engines and you're you know, below the rotor blades, you get a lot of hot wash being blown on you. And, uh, and so it, it was really, you know, you're in the hot seat. And so if you're not, so here's what the after African review is about. If you imagine at the end of an exercise, any, every exercise, and, and, and we were all about exercise and training and getting ready for, you know, whatever might be the next situation. There was a planned debrief time. And that debrief time is where I think it really solidifies how you can create a culture and how you can create a positive learning environment and what is necessary um, to make to, to, that, that, that all of that entails. So imagine you're at the end of the exercise and you're going into this big tent and all the key players go into this, uh, um, this briefing tent. And when you walk in, imagine whether you're a private or a full colonel or anything in between or general, you take off your, you, you, you figuratively take off your rank because no matter who's in that room, the rules of engagement we would talk about are you're able to address anything that happened in the operation and you are able to suggest what was right or wrong, bad or indifferent, but you don't attack the person. So if, imagine I, let's just say I'm the senior person in the room, Ken, and you're the, the lowest ranking member and you come in and you say, you know, Tom, I don't think you did that very well. Well, the way the way the spirit was created, this culture was created, is you know that was the perfect forum. Of course, you would say it respectfully, and and, and I, as a senior leader, would, would acknowledge. You know what? Okay, so how do we do this better next time? And when everybody in the room can see that the senior person in the room is open to receiving that type of criticism, then it's fair game for everybody. But it's also done in the spirit of just like we talked about how you want to serve the people that work for you, like you would treat your children, like you would treat your family. Now that spirit is reversed and that you, you get now everybody is trying to treat each other with that love and respect and participate and create these innovative ideas that don't just come from the top and that sort of thing. So I think that was probably the most valuable experience or set of experiences that I had. Um, collective experiences in the army yeah and in your case you mentioned uh, that even after you left your platoon when the next leader came in they weren't able to accomplish a goal but your platoon was able because you had trained them they were able to accomplish the goal because of some of the things that they got yeah. passed on in some of these after action reviews correct yeah yeah that's uh, so i know you want to ask me a set of different questions so let me just wrap this up with this story so you're really talking about not my platoon but when i was in command and it was prior to the first Gulf War. And when I got this particular job, I had the unique privilege throughout my career of every time I was given a command assignment, so essentially platoon, company, and battalion commander, every time I was put in that role, my role was extremely unique. And I just wasn't gonna be able to survive unless I relied on the people that reported to me and I had to trust them, so it was a blessing. and. So in this particular scenario that you're referring to, yes, I train all these folks and I work with them and it was probably the most rewarding experience of my army career. They always say that the, your, your company level command is that. And the army sends me off to graduate school and the two hardest years of my army career. And uh, I got to go, I went back to Fort Campbell after the war and, and got to see they had all returned Everybody was home and that was great. That was good for me to see all that. Uh, but here's the best part. Here's the best part about when you treat people that way and everybody feels like um, they're an equal. And, and this, this is the proudest part, part of my professional career. 27 years later, after neither myself nor my boss, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Ruth, went to war with those folks, they had their first reunion. And they didn't invite the commander who took them to war or the commander's commander, they invited Colonel Ruth and they invited me to be a part of that reunion. And, and we've met twice now, once three years ago and once last Easter. So, so yeah, thank you for bringing that up. It's a, it brings back great memories. <laughs> That's awesome. And it speaks to the love that they had for you uh, as you trained them and you taught them. 
You know, uh, speaking of act after action reviews, which is you know what I got I got to interrupt you. You know what you're absolutely right. It it speaks to the love that they recognize. Mm -hmm. Sure wasn't that way when it was going on. Just like when you're working with your children, boy, they don't they don't appreciate anything you're saying. You you think that they hate you, but deep down, they care because they they know you're challenging them and that you're you're raising the bar on them and you expect them to get higher and they love when you think that they can do better when then they think they, they themselves can do. That's, that's and exactly. yeah, and yes, I that's a servant leader. Was I soft? No, I wasn't soft. If you met any of the people who worked for me, they wouldn't tell you I was soft. Um, but they also would tell you that I did care for them. But a servant leader is considerate. And I think that's the key, right? We're considering what how do we bring out the best in our team and what do they need in that particular moment? Sometimes they need a hug, and sometimes they need to know that they can do it again or try again. Sometimes they need a kick in the tail and say, hey, you're not giving us your best. You're not, you know, you're not working and I see better inside of you. And I think that's what people respond to is when it's not just about a project or a goal that we're trying to accomplish. It's really about an understanding of the goal, but it's also an understanding of the person and that we care enough as leaders to bring out that individual. I mean, I see these riots that are happening now and all the stuff that's happening in America about uh, decisiveness and you know real conversations should take place and real reform but it, it comes down to a, a lack of belief that people understand what they whatever side they're on what they feel what they what they're experiencing and that people care enough about the those any individuals that we're gonna you know try to bring out what's the best for our culture or bring about what's the best and I think that's the role that servant leaderships play servant leadership plays in companies it, whether it's a small private owned company whether it's a large corporation or whether it's in communities um, that you know our leaders um, politicians community leaders they should be servant leaderships uh, practice ser servant leadership they should care hey real quick i do want to hit on action and then i want to get into personalities real quick um after action review though powerful tool, right? And I say uh, a statement that it's important to review to improve. And as we come through recovery, just real quick, my encouragement on all of us is to do some review about lessons learned. What did this COVID teach our companies? What did it teach us about our, our teams? What does it teach us about our customer base? What does it teach us about new models? I mean, it's always important to do these after action reviews. And to your point, Tom, a great example of where that's been applied in corporations coming out of government, uh, out of the uh, military, is um, Ed Catmule in his book Creativity Inc. talked about the that model um, as a way to produce great films at Pixar, and he talked about all of them got together. They kind of left the ranks and the titles and all that, and they're having an honest conversation about where do they need to improve and. It didn't matter whether it was the script writer or whether it was the production assistant or whether it was the director of the film. It didn't, you know, any of those things, they had to leave all the titles so that they could have an authentic conversation about how do we get better and how do we get to the end result. And I think, boy, every company needs to, to step aside because that's real servant leadership. When we're able to lay down the title, that's what Jesus did, right? Lay down the title, let's talk real about how do we bring out the best in each other to produce the best results. So those after action reviews, I think are still, uh, we can call them different names, but it really is just a review of what do we need to do to improve. Hey, yeah, you, you mentioned know, I think of something else. I, I know I'm in, I'm intercutting you off and you're good. Uh, you know, you talk about, you said this earlier, people are your most important resource. It's mm -hmm. only when you get to the point where you everyone on the team feels like they have a voice and a vote and it's going to be respected and honored and you have to do that and i started off with this humility you have to you have to demonstrate as the leader a spirit of humility you have to be willing to say i'm not perfect if i made some mistakes let's point them out and then only by you leaders have to set the example only by you setting the example gives other give the other people on the team the permission to contribute as well and it's only then do tr people really truly become your most important resource and your most valuable at that point. Sorry, go ahead. No, I love it. I think, uh, you know, I don't think we, we understand that as much. I mean, when you think about the amount of time and energy and effort that goes into training a staff, whether we're a company of one or whether we're a company of a thousand or a hundred thousand even, um, you know, the, the time 
uh, is so valuable. And it's interesting that Jesus, when you think about servant leadership, you know, Jesus spent three years with his disciples, right? He, he was in relationship with them. And I think that's really critical. He, he took that time to know them, to bring out their, their best. Um, you know, hey, Tom, I wanted to talk about personalities and different traits. You know, one of the things that I believe in servant leadership or steward leadership is I say I treat everybody fairly, but I, um, but I also treat them uniquely, that every person is different. And so even though I'm consistent, there are certain boundaries, there are certain things that we want to establish as an organization, fairness for everybody. Um, every person is unique and different. You've really dove into that through personality trainings and looking at different ways that people are wired. Can you give us some encouragement of why we should take personality tests and how does that open up the window of understanding how do we lead differently or maybe even how we interact with people on our team who might be different than us? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure where you're, you're, um, you're gleaning that from me is from the personality assessments, but I, but I'm going to, I'm going to say a quote and let's see if you or anybody on the call knows where it comes from. There is no such thing as the equal treatment of unequals. Hmm. You know who said that quote? I don't. Anybody? Chat, type it in. Ken Blanchard in the one minute manager. Hmm. When I read that quote, it was like, Oh, and as you have, you have to read the book and it's just a really short, quick read and it's easy to read, but boy, is it packed with wisdom. And oh, by the way, anybody know um, what drives Ken Blanchard, a very spiritual person, or the late Stephen Covey, or former pastor, now leadership expert, John Maxwell, or... Dale Carnegie or Norman Vincent people. I could go on and on and on. Adam Grant. People who, who've got the most to offer, my personal humble opinion, they're driven by a sense of spirit. So their spirituality. So that quote, what, what, where do I get, well, how do you, what was the exact question you asked me? Around personality traits and how people are different. Well, how people are different. It's really about how, how people, it's, it, so the personality traits is one thing, but you know, you just got to imagine this is where Blanchard was going. Let's just say we've got four people uh, on this call and they got four different tasks and w they all, they all perform four different tasks, but only one of them does that task extremely well. Hmm. One of them is far at the right, far right uh, end of the spectrum. And this goes into Hit Blanchard's next book. It's called Leadership and the One Minute Manager. And essentially it's like this. Assume you've got somebody coming in and they all have the task, four people have this task. And, and they're coming in and they're, they're brand new to the organization. They're really, really excited, but they don't know anything. So you gotta be very directed, directive. Now, if they've been in, so this is called the, the, the situational leadership model. And you could look it up, you'll see a picture on it. But, this is where it really, really resonated with me after reading his second book and how I, it, it shaped how I was going to lead for my army career. So you come in, you're new, that's development level one, the coaching level one, the, the model is your directive. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you're, you're there for a little while, your, your commitment starts to wane, but you're still low on competence. And that's when you really, really need to coach them. Now, as they start to get more competent and the commitment is still not totally there, then you just need to be more supportive and you're backing off. And finally, this is where, this is what I love most about what I learned from this. Finally, when they get to the point where, hey, I got it, you don't need to bother me anymore. You're just, you're not looking over their shoulder anymore. You're looking at a distance. This is when you truly delegate. And, you know, in those challenging roles that I had, I had to go through that process with my lieutenants and what the ones who went to combat that we, we talked about earlier. And when they got it, then I could focus my attention somewhere else where it was needed more. And it was such a freeing thing. First of all, because, you know, everybody wants to be treated with dignity and respect. Everybody wants the opportunity to learn and grow. And I knew I was doing it with them. And I knew they didn't like it because I was needling them and I was forcing them to learn. But, you know, after they got it, they were like, sir, because that's the way you talk in the military. You don't have to be here. We don't need you anymore. And I was like, you know what? You're right. And that was the best, best compliment I could give to those men um, because I had only men in that particular unit. Um, 
because they 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 were proud that they had finally got to the point where I couldn't find fault with their with their it was it was a log with logbook process about what you know different repairs for a helicopter but anyway we won't get into the details <laughs> well that's great and you use uh the disc uh in the assessments you find that that's the most one of the most helpful tools well the disc is about communication styles you know i i love all assessments i mean i mean i don't use them all but but any assessment i've ever taken i i really enjoy and um because i learned something more about myself and and i just think that 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 is you know in the cycle of learning it's always got to get back to what can i learn on what how can i be better how can i become better and it's always got to come back to how do i make those improvements and it takes a lot of introspection and not everybody can do that but if you want to be a leader um and if you want to emulate hey we need to be a learning organization you've got to demonstrate that you're a learning individual and not everybody's willing to do that yep. and we just have a couple more minutes if you have a question on servant leadership or uh, leadership test or managing your team, um, just put it in the chat box or you can send it uh, to me directly. Hey, Tom, you mentioned earlier about um, the spiritual leadership, and I appreciate the uh, um, accounting that you did of, you know, great leaders that have really led great organizations from Dale Carnegie to Napoleon Hill to John Maxwell. Um, I know your faith is important to you as well, and that's one of the reasons we've partnered together. You're launching some CEO experience, uh, CEO retreat days in Pittsburgh. Can you tell us a little bit about that mission and, and why you feel like you've been called to work with CEOs? Sure. Um, you know, when I, was, when I was in my leadership roles, those are my easiest roles. And the reason was, is because I could leverage the people on my team because of everything we just talked about, because of the way I treated them. And I would see people in other units um, that I couldn't influence because I would be usurping another, one of my peers authority. And they were depressed and dejected. And I thought, oh, this is just terrible. And, you know, I felt badly for them. And, and so the, the, the cold hard facts of the matter is, you know, I learned I feel like I learned leadership in the greatest leadership development culture in the world uh, mm -hmm. because of all the things we talked about and, and because of uh, not only that, because of the, my faith background. And I think the two of them make, make a, and so what's what I call where the military meets servant leadership at any rate, the reason why I'm doing this is because I believe that the easy, you know, when I had my commands, just to kind of salute, to, to give you the visual of this, I trained for triathlons. So how do you do spend that much time? I was working out twice a day. This is when I was young and fit. <laughs> um, how do you do that unless you've got a lot of time? And then the only way you get time when you're in charge is you got people on your team doing it. And then when I'm commanding a, at the battalion level, I got a second master's degree. Again, the only reason you can do that is because you got people on your team where everybody's got their horse hitched to the same wagon, pulling in the same direction. And I just didn't find my leadership roles a struggle. I find that, found that they were a joy. And if you're an owner or in a, in a leader of something and, and you're get back to what's your leadership purpose, if your purpose is to serve others, you know, Greenleaf's best test, make it, make them, make them servant leaders, make the, make this a better world. Um, I just feel like I can help you get there. If you, you are one of those people with that mindset. I think and, I, and I want to be able to do that because I just, for for in my heart so that I can check, talk, talk to the block number three, what am I doing for the greater society? Mm. And I think that's one of the reasons why you and I have connected because of course that's what drives you. I agree. I agree. You know, I think leaders it's, um, you know, you have good days and, and, and bad days in leadership, but when you have a team around you and you have a team of leaders that can encourage you and inspire you, I think it makes a difference. And so I'm excited about the work that Tom's doing in Pittsburgh to help Christian CEOs hear the words well done and to come alongside of them, help them discover their blind spots, help them to be accountable, help them to come up with new ideas and lead their team in a little more effective way. Hey, Tom, I know we're just about out of time, but I did get a question. I thought it was a good one and maybe we'll have to end here, but here's the question. You know, we've been spending a lot of time talking about people today and the importance of servant leadership and serving them. But the question came in that, um, how do you um, love on people when you don't like them? 
uh, which, I mean, that was the way that it was, you know, sometimes as leaders, we get frustrated with our teams. And I guess the question really centers around how do we deal with those frustrations and still love on our people or serve them? Any best ideas or advice on, on uh, how to overcome those difficult, uh, touchy, uh, those touchy moments in leaders? Oh my gosh, I can think of a gentleman <laughs> named Terry. Um, I won't give you his last name, but Ken, I don't see that question in the chat. Somebody must have sent it to you privately. All right, so here's, here's, let's just talk about Terry. Terry was a difficult cookie. He, he was a former Marine Corps crew chief. And, you know, if you think that the Army is black and white, the, the Marine Corps is, if you, if you know anything about hex colors, F, 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 zero, 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 zero. Pure black, pure white. And um, he, he was just a challenge to with everything. If it wasn't if it wasn't black or white, you know, he would challenge everything. And he, and he was, he became difficult to work with the other members on the team. And so, Terry Terry was a special project. But since I knew in his heart, he was trying to do the right thing, I would set him aside or, or he and I would go for a walk or whatever the case might be, you know, the old Carnegie thing, praise in public, criticize in private. And we would have these conversations. And I'd say, you know, Terry, I understand your point, but, and I would try to give the other thing, I'd say, you know, can you work with me here? You know, we gotta, get, we gotta work and get along because, you know, there's not, not always a right and wrong answer. Um, so I don't know how helpful that was, but, but boy, when you ask that question, he's the first person that popped, and he, he wasn't the only one, but he pops to the top of the list. <laughs> You know, the reality is where sometimes people are put in our life for different purposes and different reasons. And, you know, I do think that people challenge us at times and they want to see if we really care. You know, it's easy to say we care about somebody, but when we deal with them consistently over a long period of time and they really do see that our heart takes the time out, just like what you're talking about, get them away for just a moment and have a conversation. Um, you know, I have not been afraid to challenge people that are hard and ask them, say, hey, you're being really difficult. Why? What, what's behind this? And just the honest and authentic, back to authentic conversations with people, sometimes that brings them to kind of that shaking, kind of that Peter moment of, you know, hey, you are difficult. <laughs> you know, you're, you're one of the most difficult people I've ever had to lead. So let's talk about it, you know. And, and you know, really Terry, Terry knew that. And, and <laughs> I, we had that conversation, but I gotta tell you, it, it, and I got him to relax a little bit, not as much as I would hope, but he was the most loyal person I've ever met. That's awesome. And, and it, was good, it was an honor to have him have my back, let's, as you would say. Yeah. And I say to leaders, too, sometimes, you know, we have to have that long view. It's okay to take a break, uh, you know, from people. We can invest and invest and invest, and then sometimes we just got to catch our breath and replenish because if, we're, if somebody we're leading is taking a lot out of us, uh, it's okay but you're still having a heart of how do I give my best to this person? So, you know, I think that's really a critical, but I love that question. Thank you for, thank you for asking. And it will remain anonymous who asked me that question. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, the point, so one of the things that you caused me to realize is like, even though he was difficult and I took the time, I, I discovered the loyalty, some great trait of his that I would probably not have rediscovered otherwise had I not, treated him that way mm -hmm. so it's always worth taking the time out yep perfect it's always it's always worth going after the one lost sheep that's right that's right i love it hey you can find out more about tom if you go to uh, his linkedin page to search tom Crea on linkedin you can also go to blackhawk speaks um, and google that you can find uh, his uh, personal website and you can also find out more about it at the CEO Experience website as well. Hey, I thank you guys for joining us. And Tom, thank you for being here today for our CEO conversation. We do have a special CEO conversation this Wednesday at 2 p.m. with Brendan Kane, who is the author of One Million Followers. Uh, Brendan was the personal um, social media mind behind Taylor Swift and helping her to gain a, a worldwide following before she became famous. And so Brendan is a personal friend and I've invited him to come in. It's gonna be a special session, just 30 minutes long, but we're gonna be talking about social media. So if you have an opportunity this Wednesday at 2 p.m., we're gonna be uh, talking to uh, uh, Brendan Kane. And then next week, uh, we have another special guest, Dr. Dave Martin, who is a, um, uh, a well-known uh, public speaker, good Christian, 
a faith leader who really has a mindset of the best of our life uh, can be the rest of our, the rest of our life can be the best of our life. So we've got a couple of great uh, speakers that's uh, coming up. So I do encourage you to continue to watch the CEO conversation series, but Hey Tom, thank you for being here today. What an excellent conversation on servant leadership that I think will make a difference, not only in our lives, but in our company's lives and in the legacy that we leave. So Tom, thanks for being here. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure working with you.